couple of months ago, Baldur's Gate 3 was released to a commercial and critical fanfare that seemed to surprise a lot of people. It seemed like the industry had underestimated the popularity of CRPGs, or at the very least, a desire for deep and meaningful... C I think one of the reasons why Baldur's Gate 3 popped off so hard is that the characters were very relatable and they had good personalities. Like, I know the personalities of the characters and I didn't even really play the game. I think that's fucking impressive. Single player experiences. Soft modern? No, a lot not. of people had opinions about this. Destin Ligari at IGN claimed yeah. that Baldur's Gate 3 was causing panic in game dev circles and showed that many developers just had low standards. While Jason Schreier said that the secrets to Larian's success was that they were privately owned. And while That's a big fucking reason. But I don't think Jason Schreier is completely right. You want to know why? It's because Lost Ark is also privately owned. Those arguments definitely struck a chord with some people. I find that they're two-dimensional answers to a three-dimensional question. Yeah. If there's one thing yeah, I've learned right. from over a decade of talking to people who make successful games about why they're mm -hmm. successful, is that the answers are usually not so simple. Diablo so too. today on By Design, I'm going to pick apart the development and reception of Baldur's Gate 3 and try to find some answers as to what made this game successful. To do this, I'm going to take a look at the history of Larian Studios, interview their director of publishing about their internal strategy, Damn. talk to Co Carnage about the changing face of CRPG fandom, and try not to get too focused on the bear. Sex, oh but the bear sex was definitely <laughs> part of it. The bear sex is causing panic in game dev circles. We have a lot to cover here, but we're going to start with three topics first. Probably number true. one, the history of Larian Studios. Number two, a health check on the CRPG genre. Mm -hmm. And number three, how Baldur's Gate 3 was marketed. Yeah. Cool. Let's jump in. All right, let's see it. Uh, fuck, what's this shit? That's a lot, of, a lot of shit to read. Okay, let's get the most obvious point out of the way. Uh, I know what it is. Uh, they had to, um, this is from A16Z, which is like an investment place, and, uh, they can't talk about this stuff without, uh, qualifying that it's not like financial advice, since they give financial advice, and they make financial decisions, so, like, they have to put that in there. That's why. Baldur's Gate 3 is a fantastically well-made video game. It's wonderfully written, it looks gorgeous, it has great voice I, I acting, think. I interesting wrong. locations, it has the best dice rolling animation on the planet, and enough yeah. emergent gameplay to cause Warren Spector to piss mm -hmm. his pants with joy. Damn. Almost nothing else about Baldur's Gate 3's success is worth talking about without first acknowledging this. It may seem obvious, but the biggest key to any game's success is its design, and Baldur's Gate 3 is a fantastically well-designed game. But there is still a question here. How is it well-designed? No video game is made in a vacuum, so first, let's establish the conditions that Baldur's Gate 3 was made under, and analyze how it appeals to both existing fans of CRPGs and seemingly this unexpectedly wider audience. Well, I think also uh, another reason why stuff like this is popular is because it's turn-based. I know there's some people that are like, oh, well, we don't like turn-based, but I think if the game wasn't turn-based, it would have been less popular. Because turn-based games completely remove the need for, like, uh, player dexterity. Like, you don't need to be able to react fast, you don't need to be able to dodge the right attack or iframe an explosion or anything like that. Uh, you just have to think about the game. And also another factor with that is that you can just walk away and, you know, like take a phone call or look at something else or do something else at the same time and then come back and, and, and you're right where you left off. It's not a problem. So that's why turn-based content is, uh, is popular. And I think also Baldur's Gate is uh, it's aimed towards older people, right? What are older people? They're slow. And so that's what they are. I, I, I know this. And um, the reality is that they're probably not going to be able to, to beat Elden Ring and just go through Elden Ring super fucking fast, right? Because this shit's difficult and challenging, and it requires, like, a level of focus. I've spent the best part of a decade visiting game studios around the world, and in my opinion, if there's one element that contributes to the long-term success of any development team, an environment where people improve their skills and each new game is greater than the last, it's institutional knowledge. When game studios invest in their team's long-term health, yeah. when they keep their smartest people, it has a multiplying effect on the rest of the studio. And it has the opposite effect whenever you don't keep the smartest people, because like, for example, you go and you look at what World of 
Warcraft and like, you know, fucking like, look at Overwatch. Like, what the fuck is that shit, right? That's what happens whenever you don't have those people around because they know what's going on. But like, I do think one of the biggest reasons why this game is successful, like uh, not biggest reason, but like a very big reason is because each of the characters, like the characters are hot, number one. And number two, they look they don't look fake. Like, you look at Starfield, and you're like, this is some weird fake shit. Like, you look at these characters, and these characters look really good. Huge reason. Like, you go and you think of, like, all the anime games that people love to simp over. Like, the, the graphics for those are fucking flawless. Like, it's, it's anime, right? But, like, for what they are, it's fucking flawless. Because people can relate to characters. Like a paladin or a priest doing a spell or, you know, some D&D &D shit. I don't know, cantrips. It allows decisions to be made faster, problems yeah. to be avoided earlier, and hopefully creates the conditions where ability is the most valuable asset. Smart teams keep getting smarter. Yeah. You can see that in a lot of your favorite games. Think id Software from Wolfenstein to Quake, sure. Gorilla from Killzone to Horizon, CD Projekt from Witcher 1 to- Why don't to they just go back and make Killzone again? Why don't they just do that? I remember that, that used to be so fun. I played that game. Witcher 3, Supergiant from Bastion to Hades. Yeah. Larian is a studio with RPG pumping through their it veins. It was Blizzard, Warcraft 3 to World of Warcraft. They've been committed to this genre since the late 90s, slowly yeah. developing these skills while occasionally staving off bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. They've also learned some important and costly lessons. Both Divine Divinity and Divinity 2 were forced to market by their publishers yeah. long before the games were finished, so they kickstarted and self-published Divinity Original Sin. This game was their moonshot, and it worked out. It sold 2.5 million units and was well-received by the CRPG world. We gave it the PC Game of the Year at GameSpot. Wow. Here's me in 2014 talking to reviews editor Kevin Van Ord about how great the game is. Kevin would end up moving to Ghent to work as a writer on Divinity. Divinity Original Sin 2. And yeah, that game was extremely popular. I know, like, uh, a lot of people that I know have played that, right? Like, Soda played it. McConnell, I think, played it multiple times. Like, uh, like there's a lot of streamers, too. Like, Moon Moon, for example. I saw, I remember him playing. I think he played it with Soda. It was needed. One of the criticisms of the first game was its writing. Understandable as the team spoke English as a second language. So to help improve that aspect of the sequel, aside from hiring Kevin, they also opened up a new studio in Dublin, Ireland to focus on writing. To combat the That's relatively good. high cost of hiring game devs in Belgium, they bought and expanded upon a studio they'd worked with in wow. St. Petersburg. And to combat the crunch they'd felt on Original Sin 1, they opened up a studio in Canada so that work on the game could go through the night. They made key hires in areas they needed more knowledge and the studio now employs around 400 people in locations such as Ghent, Holy Dublin, shit. Quebec, Kuala Lumpur, That's Guildford, and Barcelona. So while Baldur's oh, like Gate has been worked on for a that? few years, it's the beneficiary of over a decade of toil and craft, mm -hmm. of business expansion and learning, of oh, working wow. in a particular genre and getting to understand their audience. When Larian started Well, one way to, to make a good thing is to fuck up a bad thing. And you do that enough times, then you make a good thing. Most of the time, whenever people do something, they mess it up the first few times. That's just how it is. ...element on Baldur's Gate 3, they were already years further down the path than most studios are now. It would be an enormous challenge for a new studio or existing studio without CRPG experience yeah. to try and make a game like Baldur's Gate 3 from scratch today. Yeah, because they're starting basically on like step five, right? Not step one. That's a good point. Okay, next up is the genre, and for Baldur's Gate 3, there are actually two genres we need to talk about. The first is computer role-playing games, yeah. or CRPGs. Think classic games like Baldur's Gate, Icewind Dale, or in more modern times, Disco Elysium. And the second is the more general- I've heard a lot of good things about Disco Elysium. Like, I've never heard a bad thing about that game, basically. So, maybe one day I'll have to try that out pop culture genre of tabletop role-playing games. Let's get that one edited away first. Tabletop role-playing games like D&D &D have gone through a popular renaissance over yeah, the past decade. I remember back when Critical Role were blowing up on Twitch yep. around 2015. Since then, it seems like most content creators have given D&D &D a go. So while D&D &D is not quite yeah, Star did. Wars levels of popularity these days, it's much more popular. No, actually, uh, this movie popped off. Like, I actually heard so many good things about this movie. 
than ever, or at the very least, many of these social barriers that held it back so long have loosened. Mm -hmm. The popularity of CRPGs, on the other hand, is a lot more difficult to quantify. Yeah. The original two Baldur's Gates are celebrated as some of the best CRPGs of all time, alongside their cousins Icewind Dale and Planescape. Yeah, it's like Baldur's Gate. You remember you used to see this game in Circuit City. Torment, but it's also fair to say that they've drifted somewhat from memory. When Disco yeah. Elysium came out in 2019, ago. it made a lot of people, myself included, mm -hmm. stand up and take notice of this genre again. Yeah. It's another fantastically well-designed game that won countless awards, sold bucket loads, and inspired a generation of developers to give this style of game design a swing. But it's not like I, I like uh, I like games like this, even though I'm not really the target audience. Like to me, what kind of games do I like? I like games like Dark Souls. Like I like action combat games. Things where things are happening in real time and like it's fast and like, you know, that that's what I kind of like to, to do. And like, I'm not really as much for like a slower paced game. Uh, I'm gonna say that I'm gonna go play classic later on today, but like, even that's faster than something like this. But uh, just in general, I, uh, you know, I, I really respect this that they do it. I think that also like storytelling and uh, like world building becomes so much more important in games like this rather than like. You know, for example, you can have a bullshit game that, like, who cares about the story whenever it's just a really good game, right? Remnant 2. Like, what the fuck happened in Remnant 2? Like, I don't know, these red guys, like, in the first game, there's not as many of them now? Like, why? Like, pff, I don't know, it's like a ball that's talk. What the fuck? Can I shoot the ball? Like, how's this work? Like these games didn't exist before Disco. Games like Pillars yeah. of Eternity and Pathfinder were keeping the fire lit for years, albeit to a seemingly smaller mm -hmm. audience. It seems like a second wave of modern CRPGs is about to break, but truth be told, this genre is a little bit out of my wheelhouse. So to get a better yeah. example of the state of the market, the expectations of fans, and the success of Baldur's Gate 3, I jumped on a call with a streamer who's been doing long play uh, yeah, streams of yeah. CRPGs for years, even when the audience wasn't really there. And I guess it also helps that he was actually in Baldur's Gate. Well, I mean, look, here's the reason why uh, CRPGs don't do well on Twitch. Is that, like, I guarantee you, if, like, let's say I announced me... McConnell, S Fand, and fucking Miz, or uh, Grayson, or some other person, Bean, or anybody else, right? That we're doing a Baldur's Gate soda, right? We're doing a Baldur's Gate three playthrough. I guarantee you that people would be fucking, there would be so many fucking people that would want to watch that on the first day. And then every day it would probably go down. And that's okay, but like that's what would happen. And the reason why is that people want to follow the story, and because the story is so long form, it's hard for people to stay engaged. That's what happens with uh w with D and D. Is Mrs. Fault? Yeah, it would be Mrs. Fault if this happened. But yeah, isn't that all content though? No, not necessarily. It's actually not all content. So, for example, games that are very well known, like for example, Final Fantasy fourteen. Final Fantasy has ebbs and, uh, you know, it goes up and down, right? And uh, what I mean by that is that, like, people have, the community has an understanding of the way the game is, and they know the story, so they know that, like, oh, fuck, like, he's about to fight Ifrit for the first time, or, oh, shit, he's about to fight Nidhogg, right? And, or, like, oh, that cinematic is going to happen whenever, uh, you, you know, like, that dude gets his arm cut off. No spoilers, but somebody gets their fucking arm cut off. And so, like, people are there ready for it. Final Fantasy doesn't do well for views. The story does, though. Think about how many people popped off watching and playing the Final Fantasy MSQ. Like, besides me, right? I'm talking about, like, in general. Three. Roar! <laughs> are you scared? Did you wet your pants? Did you? Did you? Okay. One, of, one of the tropes with CRPGs is that they're super narrative heavy. They're really, yeah. really deep. You have to be into reading. And let's be blunt. They were kind of associated with being a nerd. You had to be a big art because they had hugely deep mechanics. You had to generally take a class mm -hmm. at a local community college to know how to play them properly and yeah. build your characters right. Then you had, you know, millions of words of reading on top of them. The last kind of caveat for that is they're generally long. They're these yeah. long, giant experiences. So, the 120 you know, hour people game. just, the more of those you add up, the, the less you have in terms of an audience that 
even wants to slash can play the product. Yeah. The big thing with Baldur's Gate 3 is it's one of the first times we've seen a level of triple A quality resources go into a genre that frankly normally never makes enough money to see that. Yeah. When every single character is professionally voice acted, professionally mo capped when every single aspect of the game, especially in the first two acts on release, are rock solid with all yeah. avenues explored countless times to make sure that you can do everything you want to, when every piece of that puzzle falls into place, that creates a veneer that we're not used to seeing here. I'll never forget- And also it didn't have a bunch of cringe, weird shit in it. I think this is another big factor. Like, remember back whenever people used to talk about how America used to be full of Puritans and uh, pussies that used to complain about any sort of sexual reference? Like, Baldur's Gate 3 has, like, an approach on, like, sexuality that's very nonchalant in a way that, uh... I, I, I think it, it's refreshing for a lot of people. It's a way that treats people like they're adults. It's European, yeah. That's a big reason. How do you know without playing? Because I've seen 50,000 fucking cinematic... I spent an entire month looking at these different clips people keep sending me of the game, bro. Like, I've seen this a lot. Now, I don't know how everything fits together, but I know there's, like, this fire chick that's hot, and then there's, like, this girl with, like, this weird emo haircut named Shadowheart. People think she's hot. I, I, I mean, she is hot. And then there's the blonde guy who's an asshole, but he's likable, named Astarian. Yeah, I, I know them, for sure. One of the panels from Hell, when they mentioned of that kind of almost casually, which is so wild, but they said, you know, based on your feedback mm -hmm. and early access, we've decided to completely change the UI of our game and how it's huh. presented to the player. They had, they had yeah. their vision of what they thought was best in their game. And then thanks to their How's early the access, most importantly, thanks to their approach yeah. of what early access is, we saw them just keep yeah. adding, keep adding, keep adding user feedback, and then eventually it completely transformed. And you look at what we got from release and compare it to what we got on the day one of early access, and that shows you exactly what Larian did with their early access. They utilized it. It was a tool yeah. to make their game better. That's a big factor because like a lot of games that have early access, early access is an early access to your wallet. And games don't really use early access in the way that they should. I think it's something that, um, I, I, I'm going to be kind of like maybe a little bit positive here. Uh, I think it's happening less nowadays. But it's still, Baldur's Gate 3 happens. was in early access for almost three years, and according to Co Carnage and my own poking around online, uh -huh. there seemed to be a fairly consistent feedback loop between the players and the design team. And by having the game in early access for three years, by collecting heuristics, watching streams, and listening in on Reddit threads, mm -hmm. it gave the studio the type of access to feedback that RPG developers don't often get. Yeah. And of course, this wasn't their first rodeo. Divinity Original Sin 2 had an early access window also. Yeah. But how about the audience? Co has been live streaming to CRPG fans for a couple of years now, so oh, I wanted while, to know when this transition happened. When did Baldur's Gate 3 stop being just popular with hardcore CRPG fans and break out into this wider mainstream audience? I feel like this has to be mentioned. Whoever at Larian decided that that really shining a spotlight on the bare <laughs> scene. <laughs> Whoever decided that should happen <laughs> is a should get a marketing award. Yeah. And let me tell you why. Of course, you know, we can laugh about it. It's genius. hilarious. Yeah. But I'll never forget the next day when I saw publications and stories coming out of companies that didn't even play games. I mean, these were these were these yeah. were companies that just followed internet culture and yeah. things. They never wrote about games. And all of a sudden, Baldur's Gate 3 is front and center. And then, you know, sure, it gets through the fact that the bear love, if yeah. you want to. But then you see at the bottom of these articles, you know, this is one of the first times an RPG will let you do whatever you want and go wherever yeah. you want. And you know, all of a sudden you see all this, these organic tendrils going out. And then all of a sudden you see all these people that are, that are talking about it that never would have normally. Well, the, it's that people want to play a game that, like, it, it, as I said, I said this whenever this game came out. I thought that, like, that bear sex scene, like, nobody wants to fucking do that, right? 
But the fact that you can, bro, you can, it like creates a frame of reference in a game that's so fucking big that it's like, if they're willing to do this, they're willing to do anything. And I think that also like people in general and like Baldur's Gate 3, like it's not aimed at 15 year olds. It's aimed at like 30 year olds. Like this is, that's the people that probably play this fucking game. Like I'd say the prime audience for it. The people that have nostalgia for growing up with these games. And so I think a lot of people that are around my age, a lot of y'all's age in chat are fucking tired of having these freaks on Twitter and these people on these uh, media stations trying to demonize every single time when people are just trying to have a bit of a goof, have a little bit of a laugh, right? They try to turn everything weird. They're like, oh my God, well, you can't say that. Bitch, shut the fuck up. I'm going to fuck a bear. And it's like, it's so far outside of the Overton window of what's acceptable that like, it's appealing because that is refreshing. You see what I'm saying? And I think that so many people are tired of this shit. And now you see games doing all kinds of crazy shit. Who's showing up fucking bears? Yeah, people are trying to be in, uh, preached to about the message. Yes. And it's not even about being preached to about the message. It's about not being able to do fun stuff that's completely innocuous and non-problematic. Like, it's a fucking video game. Like, what the hell? Like, this, 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 this is a joke. We're just trying to have fun. Like, trying to have these, like, weird Karens get invested and tell them what they can and can't think. Amount of people. And the people that complain don't play the game. You're right. They don't even play the fucking game. In my chat room that had said, I don't normally like CRPGs, but I love Baldur's Gate 3. The beautiful yeah, thing about Baldur's Gate 3 is even with its incredible veneer, beautiful presentation, amazing mm -hmm. voice acting, amazing mo-capping, an incredible cast of characters, at its heart, it's still a deep, rich, story-based, mechanically deep RPG game. And a lot yeah. of times these games are seen as pretty risky. Uh, as somebody who invests in games myself, especially more recently, these are games that take a long time to make. They take a lot of effort. And to put it bluntly, a lot of times they don't have that payoff. So my big hope... Well, would... they don't have that payoff because a lot of them aren't really, like... It's hard to make a game like this. It is. Like, think about how much effort and time goes into this. Like, a, a smaller studio just could never do this. It'd be impossible. Baldur's Gate 3, and I've already seen it happening, is that it brings in new players that yeah. may have not normally been exposed to just how special these games can be. I have already talked to thousands of people at this point that have asked me, hey, I played Baldur's Gate 3. I loved it. What do I play next? What else is there? And the and I'm really Divinity hoping too. that this kind of, this new exposure to the CRPG genre as a whole will propel the entire thing forward. Um, yeah. We have another fantastic company, Owlcat that has Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader coming out at the end of this month, which is the first CRPG Necrons. we've ever seen in the Warhammer 40k universe. Just uh, last week, Josh yeah. Sawyer of Obsidian was jokingly saying that if Phil gave him $120 million, he'd make Pillars of Eternity 3. So of course I was like, do it! <laughs> Okay, quick sidebar. I never We're gonna talk about the marketing game. in just a second, but first, I want to explore something that Ko just mentioned there. He said mm -hmm. that Baldur's Gate 3 appealed to folks who would never really play CRPGs, yeah. and I'm wondering if a lot of these people are starved Bioware fans. From 2007 to 2013, we had a massive surge in popularity for role-playing games. The breakthrough success stories of World of Warcraft and Oblivion had a big yeah. part in this. And even Call of Duty was adding progression to nah, this. He's right about that. When was the last game, Scott, like Skyrim, when the fuck did that come out, right? Like, uh, 2011, 2012, I think it was 2011? Like, that was a long time ago, and like, Starfield sucks. It, it sucks? That's just how it is. And like, there aren't that many, like, what happened to Fable? Like, Fable had that weird fucking trailer, and what's the last Fable game that came out? Like, who cares? No, he's right about this. There aren't a lot of, like, those crazy big RPGs.
shooters from 07. Bioware, the creators of Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, were the tip of that spear, with Mass yeah. Effect and Dragon Age achieving mainstream success for games that were focused on talking, diplomacy, and interspecies butt rubbing. But since the ending of yeah. Mass Effect 3, Bioware have dramatically lost step with their fans, creating a handful of games that fall well mm -hmm. short of expectations, and multiplayer shooter Anthem, which really soured their relationship with the fan base. Yeah. Is the success of Baldur's Gate 3 somewhat due to a Bioware shaped hole in the market? Have fans of those games been encouraged to try something outside of their comfort zone out of sheer depression? I've no doubt. I don't. I don't think that's really the reason. To be honest with you, I. I don't. I think it's like obviously, you know, something like this doesn't happen in a vacuum with just one reason. It's probably part of the part of like a small reason, but I don't think it's a big reason. Uh, I, I think if there were a bunch of games coming out like this, people would play all of them. The the reality is there just aren't to back any of this up but it just kind of feels right what do you think let us know in the comments so we've established that Baldur's Gate 3 is a well-made game mm -hmm. and that it appropriately met the market and exceeded yeah. expectations of both tried and true CRPG fans and a more general RPG audience well every we game that's really big and it's culturally relevant attracts a people a group of people that's not endemic to that type of game like a good example of this is World of Warcraft a lot of people didn't play computer games, and they still don't play computer games. They're not gamers. They're WoW players. That's it. They don't, like, go and, like, oh, a new release comes out, I'm going to go play that. No, they just play World of Warcraft. And, like, you know, your dad, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, you have your parents, like, all the people playing the game, like, back in the day. It was very common, right? And so that's, that's how Warcraft was. And then look at Minecraft, right? There's people that they don't play games, they just play, like, Minecraft or something like that. It's, like, such a massive game that it attracts an audience of people that's outside of the normal audience. Like, Fortnite is like that. And then recently you had Elden Ring. Still haven't talked about how. To answer some of these more nuanced questions, I got in contact with Larian's director of publishing, Michael Douse. I couldn't interview Michael remotely, but he very kindly responded to an email I sent the night before he was going on a well-earned vacation. Michael works out of Larian's Dublin office, but he himself is English. So to get a character appropriate voice for his email, I stuck 20 of my best English friends' names on a list and rolled for it. First, I asked Michael, what were the commercial expectations going into launch? The sales for BG3 are within my expected projections, but it's very important to understand that these projections are foundationally defined by support from- Well, that's actually like such a, such a massive like big dick move. Like, no, we expected it to be a breakout monumental success and be the best game of the year. Yeah, no, we expected that. Yeah, this is, that was the plan. Our core audience and what we learn about who they are. There's no retail release. We didn't sim ship across platforms. Yeah. A number of commercially questionable decisions were made confidentially, thanks in no small part to what we understand about our core community as a sort of microcosm of a much broader community. Yeah. BG3 appeals to people who thought they'd like it and people who thought they'd never like it. Why that is, is probably the subject for a talk sometime. Baldur's Gate 3 is a game for people who like RPGs. So why do you think it sold so well? Is there a wider market for CRPGs than we thought? Has the popular of D&D got anything to do with it? We never use the term CRPG in our campaigns for a reason. It plays very well on a PlayStation 5. DOS 2 plays extreme- That's another big factor. A lot of games are fucking garbage because they don't play well. Like, it's actually such a simple thing. Like, Whenever you jump, the character model moves, like, in a janky way. Or, uh, you know, you run into a door, and if you run at an angle, you teleport through the door. Or, like, your character gets stuck. Gameplay is getting... Yeah, like, the gameplay works. Well on an New iPad World, Pro. that's its These biggest are weakness. are no longer computer RPGs. Doesn't play well. If you consider CRPG to mean a classic RPG, I promise you that BG3 is not a classic RPG, but a modern RPG has a lot of depth, but it's doing things most RPGs aren't able to do. The latter is a big reason for its perceived success. Every time we release a CRPG, we know that the CRPG audience grows. The only yeah. reason, at least on the industry side, that people think that the audience is small is because there isn't a big enough pool of data to pull from. How well should BG3 do? Well, what other CRPG with AAA production values are you going to look at to project from? It's a blessing and a curse. Don't get me I, I think that, like, also, 
like Baldur's Gate 3 doesn't have like a bunch of microtransactions. So with a lot of games, if the game doesn't sell well and it doesn't do well, the developer can basically just like, oh, okay, well, we'll just put a bunch of microtransactions in it, make our money back, and then try again. But with a game like this, it doesn't have any. It has zero, yeah. Well, that's what I mean. Like, it doesn't have any. Like, I, I've said it doesn't have a lot of, but yeah, it doesn't have any. You're right. Um, what I mean is that, like, the way you can monetize a game like this is very limited. And because of that, it makes developers and publishers scared because they need to make money me wrong, it's very much 99.99% a blessing, but academically the lack of substantiation, even internally, can create complex problems that require complex solutions. Yeah. Colourful mathematics. Was there a single point in the marketing where you noticed Baldur's Gate 3 gaining momentum? As with any game, the distance between announcement and release generally defines the momentum. You probably want me to say the bear, but <laughs> if you've played BG3, you probably know that there are many, many moments in the game that make you go, what the fuck? It could have been any one of those. This one in particular was chosen because it worked in the presentation flow of the press preview event, yeah. which happened to be at the right moment for marketing to get a little broader. The truth is, it's the core audience who help present and propel the game to the broader audience. Yeah, it's always they true. are the custodians of our content, to a degree. We do our thing as well, but the world decided together that it was time to start looking at what BG3 is in its final form. Probably helps that we did a press preview event, but this is the boring part of the answer. I've got a mind flayer in my run, while my entire party <laughs> stared at me in disgust. I don't know if that would have got us banned on TikTok, but it would have had the same effect. BG3 gained momentum, in truth, when all of its systems came into play, and we were able to show the game in its final form. If we'd isolated the bear without the rest of what was shown, which was a lot, it would have just been a week-long meme at best. No, and point. how important do you think the time and early access was for marketing the game? Blessing and a curse. Not a lot of what we did was conventional commercial wisdom. We didn't sim ship, we announced as part of Stadia, we're a Ooh. narrative game in early access. We didn't release much story content other than Grimforge. We were late. There was a war which made us late again. In spite of all of that, what early access does do is it lets you hone in on the people that stick around. We really got to know our community and through that we got a microcosm of a broader audience. We got to understand our language with this game and to understand what resonates. In spite of all the downsides, Early Access helped us to understand that. Look, this is going to be a no bullshit operation. We talk to them, they talk to us, we all work it out together. I think that's another big factor that I think a lot of people appreciate, especially from like Eastern developers. Like whenever uh, the, like the Throne and Liberty guys were like, yeah, so, uh, you know, the first question we want to answer in the Q&A is, is the game pay to win? And are we going to make it pay to win? The second answer is, how are we going to monetize the game? And they actually just are like, okay, this is directly what the problem is. The Eastern, yeah, no, but like, like, they're talking about the thing that you care about. Not like, what's the first question? Why is the game so fun? Well, we've got a great team. Shout out to the team, guys. Next question. You know, it's not bullshit questions. So I think that a lot of people appreciate being being talked to like that, even though it's not something that, uh, you know, conventional PR wisdom allows, which I think is because it's not good wisdom. But at the same time, this is what a lot of companies take seriously. I wouldn't have had it any other way. The name of this show is By Design, and it's meant to be somewhat self-aware. Over the years from talking to developers, I've learned that all decisions, be it design decisions, mm -hmm. gameplay decisions, product or marketing decisions, you can make the most well-informed choice you want, but whether or not that decision was a good idea or not, is kind of decided by the player. Yeah. So no success or failure is really by design. And this design. is what I think a lot, of, a lot of developers don't understand, is that like they try to, uh, like, you know, they have like an idea of like what their game is supposed to be, but like the players don't like it. Well, if the players don't like it, then change it. It's actually that simple. Like figure out why they don't like it and fix that problem. It's not like, oh, you should never have to eat shit to get to the chocolate. 
Nine. It's the culmination of dozens of informed decisions that push and nudge a game in lots of different directions. <laughs> but I believe there are some absolutes we can take away from the success of Baldur's Gate 3. First, yeah. it's really well made, crafted by a team of developers who were dedicated to this genre for sure. years when it was out of fashion. Secondly, the market came to meet them, either because of the general popularity of tabletop role-playing, because of games like Disco Elysium that exposed new players to this style of game, or due to modern conveniences like voice acting that helped to soften the market and thirdly i think the also um the fact that like a lot of the scenes and like the funny things in the game can happen pretty quickly and the characters look good enough to where it's compelling even to person that doesn't play it it made sharing those moments and sharing that stuff on like social media uh really easy to do so like i would see clips from Baldur's gate all the time just because people are like hey look at this funny scene the game was smart it's in its mean publishing game, yeah. and marketing strategy. It never it felt like a game you needed to have played the original two Baldur's Gates to understand, or even to have experience in the genre to enjoy. It was approachable, it was personal, and the marketing was honest. And a smartly executed early access strategy ensured that Baldur's Gate 3 launched in as finished a state as possible. Yeah. So what can other developers learn from the success of Baldur's Gate 3? Simply have as much money as it takes to make the best possible version of the game you want? Well, the thing about games development is that creative decisions that teams are allowed to make to put the game into early access for three years, to make sure every character is voiced, to ensure every player choice is mirrored by the well, game. Well, this is what developers have to understand is that the player doesn't care about how hard development is. This is not a relevant bit of information. The developer doesn't care about the uh, publishing deadline that you have. The player doesn't care about how often you're working. This doesn't matter. So you can't expect the player, the customer, to care about these problems. And I think that you have these developers that are like, well, we can't do any better than this. Well, if you can't do any better than this, then you should have planned better because you can't just release garbage and be like, well, you know, we couldn't do any better because people are like, well, OK, well, then we're not going to buy it. And I think that's what happens a lot. In some way, all of these decisions that seemingly raise the standards of the game to a level yeah. that gamers expect are ultimately informed by the budget, especially at a AAA level. Right. And this is where things get a little bit more complex. But it, it's, again, it's, it's the thing. The customer is always right. If the game is problematic or there's something that's not enjoyable about the game and people don't like it or it's unfinished like Diablo 3 or, sorry, Diablo 4, well, both of them, um, the player doesn't really care about, like, Oh, well, the public, well, we had to get it out. And like, th none of these things matter to the player. Like, these are all like, these are things that matter to the people that work there. Nobody gives a fuck about how hard you worked. Nobody gives a fuck about how, oh, how long it took or, you know, the publisher, any of this. Like, it's just, it's irrelevant. You just shut up and make the game. Yes. If the game doesn't work. It's a bad game. If the game does work, it's a good game. Okay, you released a game that doesn't work. All right, bad game. But, 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 no, there is no buts. Bad game. According to Jason Schreier and Wikipedia, Larian is a private company. But after some digging around on Irish business registries and paying a few quid to get mm -hmm. access to old documents, I found that Larian Group Holdings Limited, based mm -hmm. in Dublin, is in fact 30% owned by Tencent. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't get much more detailed on their financials than that, but while the Divinity Original Sin game sold well, I suspect much more capital would be required to keep a 400-person sure. studio operating for years. It makes sense that the company would leverage their position to bring in extra capital to help fund all this growth. Now don't get me wrong, this isn't like a smoking gun, this is just the reality of what it takes to make games of this quality in 2023. And it has a lot to do with how games are sold. The truth is, you cannot reduce the business operation of a company down to whether or not they are publicly traded or privately owned. I don't like this idea where people get mad about Tencent because it's Tencent. Tencent owns, like, percentages in almost, like, every gaming company. Like, I would say they probably own percentages in most big gaming companies. Because they want to make money making games. Like, it's not like every game that Tencent makes is, like, just this fucking, like, pay-to-win garbage or, like, Chinese spyware or something stupid like that. Yeah, they complete 
they completely own Riot, and Riot is great. So I, I just think it's a very one-dimensional way to look at things. And also, like, you look at it from Tencent's perspective. Why do they want to invest millions of dollars into a studio and then tell the studio to do something totally different? Why would they want to do that? That's a, it's a bad idea. Then why would you invest in a studio in, a, in the first place if you want them to do something totally different than what they were doing? Privately owned companies can have debtors and publicly traded companies can have majority ownership. For Somebody says they can add censorship and, and they do it? Uh, I mean, clearly they don't, uh, number one. Uh, number two, censorship is usually regional. It's either regional or it's a decision made by the developers for some like social or political reason. Like that's reason. That's really what what it is. Example: the similar European success story of CD Projekt. When they became public through a share takeover of a Polish tech firm, it allowed them to access new yeah. forms of capital to invest in their studio. In the 2008 words of Adam Kaczynski, the immediate financing we obtained through the deal will allow us to pursue our operational goals in troubled times. We need the money. The troubled times he's talking about were the financial crash of 2008, and the operational goals was funding their breakthrough hit, The Witcher 3. Yeah. Good financial planning this can part. lead to good games, but bad financial planning rarely does. Uh -huh. As the worlds of big tech and games have converged over the past few years, we've seen much more investment from private equity or venture capital firms into the world of gaming. I mean, I'm literally being paid by a venture capital firm to produce this series. And part of the reason for this is that successful games can come from both small teams and large teams, but both of these are usually in need of some funding. Games for the well, most it's not the problem like the funding with the games is never really the problem in most in most circumstances i think it's usually that like the development team doesn't know what they're doing or they're not experienced in what they're doing i think that's by far what the main issue is because i'll see them doing things like with world of warcraft for example like what do you mean you have nothing to do just 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 add a vendor with the gear and then the game is fixed Oh, this took a year? No, it didn't. You just weren't doing anything. That's what happens. Yeah, it's a, it's a crutch. And like you see other games that have this problem too. Like New World is is like this. It was well was like this in a huge way. Like how did you like every player was asking for like these very simple solutions and then the simple solutions took a year in order to be applied. That's what the issues were. That was the main problem. Everything else, like, yeah, obviously you have, like, meta-level problems with, like, content and, like, systems. But a lot of times, I think the issue is just simply no communication. Straight up that simple. No communication. Parse don't make any money until they're finished and released. This creates a massive financial burden on the part of the creator to fund the entire production of the product until they can make yeah. any money back. And given the time it takes to make AAA games in this modern era, something that is exponentially longer than what they had to deal with back in the day, mm -hmm. just the level of capital investment required is simply out of reach for most. Making games at this scale and level of quality requires smart business planning. And while Baldur's Gate 3 was likely not financed from the CEO's savings account, it is the CEO's vision that made this game possible. Sven and the many others who have been part of Larian's journey throughout the many layers of CRPG hell they've scrambled through have done what they've done with a clear artistic goal in mind to make the AAA CRPG of their dreams. Along that path, they've learned valuable lessons in business about the type of creative and financial independence they value. They learned how to expand their business in ways that benefited the development of the game, reducing crunch, and expanding the knowledge base of the team. And more importantly, they learned how to make the type of complex, high-quality game that we get to enjoy in Baldur's Gate 3. Making well, that's the thing, is at the end of the day, like, yeah, a lot of, you know, blood, sweat, and tears went into making the game. But the game that you get out of it is a good game. Like, there are a lot of games that, like, there's massive amounts of crunch time and people are overworked and the game comes out and it's a piece of shit. 
games is incredibly difficult. Some publishers love to nickel and dime gamers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Are some they developers do. less interested in innovation than others? Of course. But we shouldn't reduce the success of games like Baldur's Gate 3 down to these personal values or platitudes, especially when the reality is a much greater story over decades. I think if Baldur's Gate 3 had elements of microtransactions and pay to win stuff in it, it probably still would have been massively successful. The game plays very well. It's a complete game. If you look at a lot of these games, like, and here's the thing, I've seen these games, these like pay to win, like phone games. You, you want to know why they're bad? It's because the gameplay sucks. The, the, it's just go fucking garbage. That's why. It's not because it's like a, oh, well, you know, it's because it's pay to win. No, the gameplay is like, it, it's the worst thing. Like, you don't even, like, you're happy to spend money because at least the shop menu works. Nothing else in the game even works. It's horrible. So that's the way I feel. Like, that's the real reason. Like, look at Genshin Impact. That game's massively popular. It's pay to win. So it's like, yes, pay to win is a big factor for a lot of people, for sure. But the game being good, that's a bit bigger. It's the byproduct of a lot of toil and craft. Yeah. A studio with a laser sharp focus working within their core competency, using early access to <laughs> refine that experience and then marketing that game to a much wider audience, an audience of gamers who were starving for an RPG experience with more meat on its bones. And hey, sure. You could also fuck the bear. Also fuck the bear, yeah, that's about right. That's a good video. Genshin's a good game, gets bored easily. Well, I'm just saying, like, I think the big reason, uh, the, the big reason why this happens and, like, why it's so popular uh, is because the game plays well. And I think that too many people don't take that seriously. Like, do you want to know why Honkai Star Rail went down massively in terms of sales? It's because there's nothing to do in the game. That's the problem. It's that simple. There's nothing to do in the game. You can't do anything in the game. Like, the events are transparent. Uh, there's not a lot of content to them. Uh, that's it. Now, if you had a game that's, like, very expansive, there's a lot of things to do, like there was at the beginning of the game, it was very popular. And so, just like Genshin, you have Tower of Fantasy 2. I'm not sure exactly about that, but yes, you're probably right. Uh, every game should be Elden Ring from now on. Well, what I'm saying is that... There's a video right there. Make sure you give it a sub, give it a like. This is a very good one. I'm going to look at a few comments here, too. We'll take a look at it. Let's see here. Tune and press the download intelligent from Larian is in interviews and snippets. Yeah, because they're normal people. Exactly. Like, I think that's a big reason. Uh, beyond the obvious pain for the staff themselves, huge numbers, layoff game industry is really going to uh, damage that in institutional knowledge. Uh, yeah, I think you're definitely right about that. Most important part of success is it's a labor of love. Yeah, people are doing it because they love doing it. Uh, I spent 200 hours in the game so far, and I haven't finished it. Holy fuck, man. Yeah, there's a lot to do, man. There's a lot, a lot, a lot to do. Yeah, I think this is the case for a lot of games, and uh, I just think that game developers need to stop expecting players to play a bad game because the game developer had a problem. Like, there will never be a point where game developers and, like, players play a game and give a fuck about this kind of stuff more than uh like you know like oh okay that's sad like if the game is problematic then that's it and uh that's how i feel when there are people uh like ballers gate 3 yeah uh let's see game developers are so good at making bad games well the reason why uh, I'm, I'm gonna be honest i think the reason why a lot of developers are bad at making games is because they don't understand the games I, I i think that they just don't know what they're doing straight up they don't know what they're doing. And, and like, I think a really good example of, like, how systemic this is, is the fact that you load every item in, in somebody's stash in Diablo 4. How is this possible? How is it possible that, you know, we'll look at some PoE, like, just for a second, right? Uh, I'm not even going to look at the new stuff. I'm just going to look at one thing right here. How is it possible that That you can have a boss fight like this in Path of Exile 2 Beta. This boss fight already has more mechanics that are better telegraphed and better designed 
than every single boss in Diablo 4, and the game isn't even in a playable demo yet. This is a joke, and there's 90 of these bosses in the game? What the fuck are you talking about? Like, how is this a problem from anything other than just pure fucking incompetence? Like, I want to see the developers actually play some of the bosses in Diablo 4. Like, how do you feel that, like, this boss is infinitely more better designed and it's just so much better in every single way? Like, what's going on here? How does this happen? This is, this is, guys, keep in mind, this is made by a studio in New Zealand. This is not a AAA studio at all. Like, the guy that made this fucking game, the main guy, the way he got this game off the ground, one of the ways was talking to Kriparian on his stream ten years ago. And this is just blows Blizzard away. Like, watching this makes me mad. It's a big studio now? Oh, yeah, right. Crip is, uh, based though? Yeah, he is. Absolutely. How many hours in PoE have you got to Diablo 4? I've probably put... How many hours in a PoE? Three to four thousand, if I had to say. Probably three to four thousand hours into PoE. And, uh... I'm trying to think, like, uh, let's see. What else is there? Let's see if there's any more bosses here. You guys can see here. Yeah, here's another one. Wa right, watch this. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've played a lot. And, um, check on Steam. No, I've always used the launcher. Uh, I've never, like, I remember whenever it went on to Steam. What I'm saying is, like, the fact that it's, like, a budget or whatever... I think that there is no excuse you can tell me that would make me think that it's justified that Diablo's bosses are so horrible when PoE 2's bosses completely blow them out of the water and it's not even an alpha yet. Like, I cannot think of a single excuse of why that's okay. Hollow Cure is a perfect example. Yes, look at Hollow Cure. There you go. Diablo 4 is a massive letdown to me. I think Diablo 4 is a great game in a lot of ways. But what makes me mad about Diablo 4 is that it can, it should be Diablo 4. This should look like the, this should look like Diablo 4 at home. You understand? This should be like, um, what's a good example? Ah, oh, Jesus. I'm, I'm trying to think of, like, a, a very good example of, like, what, what two games are, like, you know, this big of a difference. Uh, yeah, like, PoE versus Torchlight. Yeah, this, this, this should be great value Diablo 4. This should be Diablo 4 that you play whenever you can't afford Diablo 4. This should be Diablo, uh, you know, like, yeah, this is, like, instead of, like, playing Minecraft, you're playing Roblox, right? No Man's Sky versus Starfield. Something like that. A Digimon, yeah, this should be Digimon, Diablo 4 should be Pokemon. It's so disappointing. And it's like, you know, that was the expectations, because you know if this game, if Diablo 4 had came out in the year 2001, this game would have completely blown every other game out of the water. It would have been fucking insane. That's just disappointing, man. And I don't think that there's any excuse other than a lack of talent. I don't think money has anything to do with it. I really genuinely don't. I think they don't know what the fuck they're doing. And it is actually that simple. Yep, well, lack of direction, no experienced devs. Well, they don't need experience. Just listen to what people say and then do it. Look at what other people do and then do that. Like every single, almost every attack that you see here. So like, I'll give you an example. Every single effect here Watch. Watch again. That, that's how many games have something like that? Where it puts a line on the ground, then it goes out. What's it doing? It's frozen, it's frozen, nothing's happening, right? A lot of games. Okay, you have an attack like that. Many games have that. It's actually kind of unique. 
This one right here. Um, what do you call it? Uh, Lost Ark. Uh, Gate 4 Belshaza has a mechanic exactly like this, except for it's with like a, uh, uh, a square and not a triangle. Exact, yeah, phase rebel. Yeah, exactly. Same mechanic. Basically another variation of the same mechanic. A flurry attack. Wow. You guys ever seen that before? Oh, yes, you have. That's the exact attack pattern of the Hydra in Dark Souls 1. Think about it. Oh, look at this. This is the same exact mechanic that Arkali has in Act 4. Or, sorry, Act 8. 7? Act 7 of PoE 1. It's just more randomized. Oh, there it is again. The Brelshaza one. So, my point that I'm making with this is that... If you play a lot of games... Most of these things are not brand new. Why are you hating on it? I'm not. That's my point. Is that this boss is fucking incredible, and it's amazing, but almost every ability that it has, Grinding Gear Games didn't invent this. They didn't invent these mechanics. And that's what I'm saying, is that like you don't need to be like massively like innovative with everything. Like, I bet a lot of the things with Baldur's Gate 3 aren't really new. A lot of them are just really good versions of things that already existed. Another example of that is Elden Ring. A lot of things with Elden Ring are not new, but they're just really fucking good. So that's my point, right? Is like, it just makes me so furious to see stuff like this happen with like uh, PoE 2. This game is just so far ahead of the competition, it's insane. And there's no excuse for it. Jesus, man. Look at the amount of uh, look at the amount of mechanics that are even happening, and look at the telegraph here. Like you can clearly see what the boss is doing. Like he's doing a slam, right? And then look, look, look. Let, let's watch frame by frame. A completely full animation. You see that? Perfect animation. The damage isn't happening halfway through the slam. There's no, like, weird, like, first his hands are like this, and then there's, like, frames like this, like in Lies of P or something like that. Uh, it, it's flawless. There's no frame skipping, yes. Compare that to a turd that's Uber Lilith. Yeah, or Duriel. Duriel's decent, but it's not that... It, this boss has more mechanics than Duriel. It's more interesting than Duriel. It, look at the Blood Bishop, yeah. Lies of P hater? I thought Lies of, Lies of P is the best Souls-like game that's ever been made, okay? But yes, I have a lot of complaints about the game. By the um, way, developer well, agree agreed with me with most of those complaints. That's why they, they made changes based off of them. We're good. All good. Anyway, if you were to have... Yep, there it is. And so, uh, don't forget, would you like most of P? The weapon customization. It was by far better than anything. It's even better than the From Software games. To be honest, it was really incredible. So all I'm saying is that, like, bro, I, I could go... I could mauled about this so hard... But, like, the point that I want to make with all of this is the fact that all of these problems are problems because the developers don't understand what they're doing. Bad take, Diablo 4 is made especially for casuals and it accomplishes that. Oh, so you say, like, there are no mechanics because it's made for casuals and casuals don't want to play a hard boss? I disagree with that entirely because the existing mechanics aren't telegraphed well and aren't designed well. I'll give you some examples, okay? Because usually, like, whenever I make statements like you do, I actually have examples. So, um, the Blood Bishop's grab is not frame perfect, and it's not even remotely close to frame perfect. You can be totally out of it, and you'll still get grabbed. Can I confirm this with chat? Everybody knows this is the case? We all know this? Yes, okay, this is a well-known fact. Um, second, uh, the Tomb Lord. Whenever he puts the ability on you that puts darkness around your character, have you ever moved out of that ability and then had the darkness effect still apply? Okay, alright, number three. Um... Uber Lilith. On the second phase, every single um, every single effect in that entire encounter is on the same color wavelength. It is all different shades of red 
sometimes overlapping shades of red. It's so bad, it is. Also, another little bonus effect. Whenever Duriel comes out of the ground, the fissure area underneath the circle, the hitbox of it is larger than the circle. So if you're next to it, it will still kill you because you're, you're too close to it, even though it's visually indicated that you're not. Um... Fuck, let me think. Uh... Is that enough? <laughs> yeah, is, is that enough? Like, I mean... I feel like that's pretty good, right? So you're just wrong. The, I, like, I would agree with you if the mechanics worked, but they don't even work. 